Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. I, what I think that we should do after this is all done, though, uh, just for uh, the comic value of it, is maybe try to count how many logical fallacies that this gentleman uses uh, within <laughs> the hour and 16-minute video. <laughs> yeah, we'll try it, but um, yeah, it's quite numerous. No, 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 the gospel writers. Yeah, Luke was one of the gospel writers. <coughs> Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with Mark. Yeah, so she brought up, she started to talk about the book of Acts, and said, no, 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 the gospel writers. Like, he apparently doesn't know that Luke wrote both Luke's gospel and... I mean, what do we expect from a Muslim apologist? Seriously. The eyewitnesses, the authors of the Gospels, were they eyewitnesses? Yes. And you said, yeah. Now, now you tell me where any of those writers claim to be eyewitnesses. Um, and Luke's Gospel, as Elizabeth had mentioned, um, it's written by the same author as she wrote Acts, and so we know that Acts. Uh, we know that Luke, the author of Acts, was a traveling companion of uh, Paul, and uh, we know that uh, Luke was a traveling companion of Paul, incidentally. Um, and we know that uh, Luke chapter one, Luke tells us that he interviewed people who were eyewitnesses. He says in verse one and through four, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. In respect to the Gospel of uh, Mark, um, we have some internal evidence that for Peter being the eyewitness behind the Gospel of Mark. Um, so there's both external evidence and there's internal evidence. Richard Balcom in his book, and Jesus and Eyewitnesses, document some of that internal evidence. You believe Matthew, not Matthew? Uh, I think it is. Uh, what's, what's so why is it according to? What is that? No, 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 no. no. That's so, Matthew's version of uh, Jesus' gospel, you believe Matthew, the tax collector, wrote it? Sorry? You believe Matthew's version of the life of Jesus and his teachings uh, was written by Matthew, the disciple? Yeah. Right. Why then, then why then did he need to take his work from Mark? Why did Matthew need yes. to copy from Mark? They were always, all using the same, all using the same material. No. I, don't, I don't think that being a particular problem, though. What's, 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 the, um, what's the actual problem? You've got the same the Gospels. Okay, was Mark, he said, was Mark and a disciple? Oh, this is Mark. I don't think he was a disciple, no. It was Matthew? Matthew was a disciple. So, so does Matthew need to copy from a man who's not a disciple, if he is a disciple? It makes no sense. If, if you witness an event, yes. yeah, if you witness an event, then you need to go to somebody who wasn't there and ask him what happened. Right. And then copy what he says. Verbatim. Word for word. Well, hang, hang on. They, they, they all, they all, sorry, say it again. Sorry. Something else. Okay. Reading thread, sorry. Does it not seem strange to you yeah. that a man who is witness to an event yes. goes to a man who wasn't a witness to an event and copies what happened to that event from him? You're assuming he's copying word for word what this other person said, this um, second source. No, I'm saying yep. Matthew's copying from Mark. If, if, if Matthew is basically... Now, the first principle... So no, no, before we go there, though... No, no, just your no, but before you go there, you have to accept whether <laughs> Matthew is copying from Mark. Back up, back up. If, if you're saying that Matthew is basically all of his work on Mark, as an example... 80% of it. I, 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 I would I, I sort of say that's a little, a little bit problematic, on the basis of what you've argued. Uh, problematic in what sense? Because he's using, like, like, like you said, he's using second... All oh, right, right. So you're saying I'm right, then. It is problematic. If, if, if he is. If, if, if what you're saying is correct. All right. Unless there's a counter argument, but I can't really think of anything on the top of my head. Huh? Unless there's a counter argument to that, but I can't really think of anything on the top of my head. 
Luke, I don't blame copying because Luke wasn't there. Well, by, by his own admission. Yeah, by his own admission and Right. Yeah, so that's... Matthew copying is problematic because it means he wasn't there. I, I, I'd say it's very good argument. And then if he wasn't there, he's not the disciple of Matthew. A copy of Mark, Matthew's Gospel contains 92% of the text of Mark. Yeah. So Matthew has 92% of Mark. Doing higher criticism right now. We'll move on to textual criticism, and then we can deal with the content. No problem. No, I just want no, no higher criticism. Don't go into it, and there is no, no. category of people who have a legitimate. Okay. First thing, them. all of the gospels, according to some of the greatest scholars of Christianity, are anonymous. Right? So they were recorded. They don't know who wrote them. They don't know who wrote them. We don't know who wrote them. Um, well, I, I gave a case earlier for um, Mark um, being the author of Mark's gospel and being influenced by Peter. I have also. Um, given um, some argumentation for uh, 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 Luke's gospel. But by far the, the, the most common datings are that Mark was written sometime around 65 or 70 A.D., Luke and Matthew about 15 or 10 or 15 years later, John maybe 10 or 15 years later, so John maybe around the year 90 or 95, Matthew and Luke around 80 to 85. These are the dates that are taught uh, throughout the universities and divinity schools and seminaries of North America and Europe. I, I take them to be right for reasons that I can give you if anybody really wants to know. It's a complicated argument. Second point, none of the authors were eyewitnesses. Paul himself indicates that he was not an eyewitness, and none of the gospel writers was an eyewitness. They don't claim to be written by eyewitnesses, and they don't claim to be written by people named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are later traditions that were added to the Gospels. These traditions do not start appearing for about a hundred years. Some people think that there is an early church father named Papias who attests to the witness of Mark and Matthew, but in fact there are very solid reasons for thinking that Papias, who lived around the year 120 to 140, is not referring to our Mark or our Matthew. The first time anybody refers to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John by name is Irenaeus in the year 180. They are anonymous. You might not think so because they have the title, The Gospel According to Matthew. Whoever put that title on it was an editor later. The original books are all anonymous, written in the third person. Moreover, the followers of Jesus were Aramaic-speaking peasants from Galilee, lower-class men who were not educated. In fact, Peter and, uh, and John in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, are literally said to be illiterate. They couldn't read and write. Of course not. They were fishermen. They didn't go to school. The vast majority of people in the ancient world never learned to read, let alone write. And their native language it was Aramaic. These books are written in Greek by highly educated, rhetorically trained writers who are skilled in Greek composition probably not disciples and don't claim to be disciples. That wasn't the question. It was a very simple question. The eyewitness, the authors of the Gospels, were they eyewitnesses? Yes. And you said yes. Yeah. Now, now you tell me where any of those writers claim to be eyewitnesses. They use, in, the, in Acts. No, claim to be eyewitnesses. Yeah, in Acts. Got... Well, actually, uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, jo um, John's Gospel does um, in uh, John chapter, uh, um, in John chapter 21, um, John says, um, in verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. And he's speaking, of course, concerning the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John, the apostle, is the only disciple not named in John's gospel. And so by inference, it suggests strongly that, that the, the author of this gospel is claiming John the apostle to be the author 
Um, and that comports very well with the external evidence for that as well. A couple of stumbling blocks for Jonathan's theory. Firstly, we've already touched on the lack of literacy on the part of the supposed gospel authors. Let's zone in on John the son of Zebedee. Let's have a read of what Bart Terman says. But well, there is an even higher probability bordering on certainty that, that John the son of Zebedee could not write. He was a fisherman from rural Galilee. Fishermen were not educated. They were very low class peasants. John would never have gone to school. Where he lived, there were no schools. He never would have learnt to read, let alone learn to write in Greek, let alone learn to write sophisticated, philosophically informed prose narratives in Greek. I think there is virtually no chance that the historical John of Zebedee wrote the Gospel. And secondly, concerning the identity of the beloved disciple, Bart Herman makes an important observation. He writes, and then comes the key verse. 21:24. that's in John. In reference to this beloved disciple, the verse says, This is a disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. This verse is widely taken to mean that the author, the one who has written these things, is in fact the beloved disciple. If you look closely at the verse, it says just the opposite. Notice, the disciple is the one who testifies and wrote these things, and we, and we know that it is true. Who is the we here? Obviously it is the author and those with him. The author differentiates between him, that's the beloved disciple, and us, that's the author, and those with the author. So the author is decidedly not claiming to be the disciple. Instead, he is indicating the beloved disciple, whoever he was, wrote down some of the things that he observed. What this means then is that the Gospel of John does discuss this shadowy figure, the unnamed beloved disciple, but the author does not identify himself with him or speak of him using the first person pronoun. When the author does use the first person pronoun, it is precisely to differentiate himself from the beloved disciple. So once again, we have a completely anonymous book. John wait, waits until uh, born and John waits in, until the year 100. That means he's 100 years old. And the book of Acts says that John was illiterate in the year uh, 35. He was illiterate. So this man is illiterate at 35. He suddenly, when he's a hundred, he writes this gospel talking about the Logos and his Greek is like amazing and it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Why would he wait so long to write something down? He probably didn't write it. Dr. Lycona. Um, ancient biographies, uh, the gospels are a subset of Greco-Roman biography. Uh, Richard Burge has an excellent book on it. It's called What are the Gospels? Uh, it's been very influential within the world of New Testament scholarship. And ancient biographers did vary in the amount of liberties that they would take when writing biographies. They certainly took liberties at times. And that's why you do have some of the discrepancies, uh, like the day Jesus was crucified. I think that John probably altered the day in order for a theological, to make a theological point there. They certainly took liberties at times, and that's why you do have some of the discrepancies, uh, like the day Jesus was crucified. I think that John probably altered the day in order for a theological, to make a theological point there, crucified. I think that John probably altered the day in order for a theological, to make a theological point there. So, to sum up, it is now widely agreed among New Testament scholars that Jesus himself, the historical individual, did not think of himself as divine and did not teach anything like the later doctrine of the Incarnation. 
The New Testament sayings in which Jesus seems to claim divinity, such as he who has seen me has seen the Father, I and the Father are one, I am the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, are all in the Gospel of John, and it is widely agreed they cannot be responsibly attributed to the historical Jesus, but are words put into his mouth by a later Christian writer around the end of the first century, some 70 or so years after Jesus' life. I think that John probably altered the day in order for a theological, to make a theological point there. Did Jesus actually die on the cross? Well, the Gospel according to John says that a spear thrust was uh, put in his side, and one might think that that surely killed him. But uh, historians generally believe today that that spear thrust is not historical. John has introduced that into the story. It is not mentioned in the, in the synoptics, and John has introduced that for his own theological reasons. Partly, some say, to make sure that everyone would know that Jesus actually died because he was speared in the side. Well, take away the spear thrust, which is not historical. What is the fact then about the story? What actually killed Jesus? There's nothing. Now, notice. All Jesus says at his trial, according to Mark, the oldest of our written testimonies, is I am, in a quotation of, of scripture at one point, and then so you say, in the next uh, trial before Pilate. Now compare that to what goes on in the Gospel of John. I mentioned this a bit in my lecture on the Gospel of John, how its narrative details are very different from synoptic Gospels. One of the places where this is really different is the trial of Jesus. John 18, verse 19. I'm not going to read all of this because it's just way too long. This is part of the, the interesting thing is that the trial of Jesus goes on for a long time in the Gospel of John. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Already, Jesus has said a ton more now than he said in the other Gospels at his trial. But then he just keeps going on. Uh, they, he said some more things. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus in the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So according to John, Annas and Caiaphas are kinfolk, and they're sort of both members of the high priestly family. So you can go on and on. Uh, at 28, verse 28, um, it's the trial before uh, they took Jesus to Pilate. Pilate went out to the Jews and said, What an accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered, We are not permitted. Blah, 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 blah. It goes on. Pilate talks to Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Did not, or did others tell you about it? Pilate said, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus said, My kingdom is... Jesus just has a, a whole conversation with Pilate, which leads to that wonderfully uh, quotable phrase that everybody knows about where uh, finally Jesus talks about truth and Pilate says in a phrase that could be sincere or a lot of people answer it as being cynical, what is truth? Very famous quotation from the Gospel of John. And then of course, there's the whole passage. Any of you seen uh, uh, the uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, the play or the movie? There's a whole scene where Herod, this is actually the son of Herod the Great now, but there's a trial before Herod, also in the Gospel of John, not really uh, in Mark at all, but in the Gospel of John, you get this whole trial before Herod, and according to the Jesus Christ Superstar, this is when Herod kind of dances around on this raft and has showgirls, and they all do this, so you are the Christ, you're the great Jesus Christ, you know, prove to me that you're no fool, walk across my swimming pool, and all this sort of thing. So there's a whole scene, and Jesus Christ Superstar, the whole scene wouldn't be possible without the Gospel of John because it's not in the other Gospels. So this is a famous scene. All of that's different in John. So what's historical? How do, how do scholars decide you have these very, very different, was Jesus completely silent at his trial, as it seems to be in, in the Gospel of Mark? Did he not offer um, any reasons for what he did? Or did he have theological and philosophical discussions with Pilate about his message? What's historical? In that case, Basically, most historians are going to say none of it is. None of the trial stuff can we be confident would be historical. For one thing, this, we just have this very, very differences. But there's one very little interesting piece of evidence about this. According to all the Gospels, where were the disciples after Jesus was arrested? 
Anybody remember? They vamoosed. The, the Gospels say that the disciples ran away at the arrest of Jesus. So maybe, according to some traditions, according to these traditions, maybe Peter was there sort of in a courtyard out removed from the trial. But none of the disciples of Jesus would have been allowed to be present at any trial, whether it was of his high priest or Pilate. They wouldn't have been allowed in. These were peasants from Galilee. They're fishermen. They don't go walking into Pilate's headquarters. So who would have been there to report these different trial things? There are no stenographers in the ancient world sitting down taking notes of these trials. There are no court records. There are no journalists. Nobody was there who later Christians had access to so that they could possibly have known what went on in the trial. So according to most historians, we just say all of this trial stuff was very much made up by later Christians. Why? Because they f figured you had to have a trial if you're going to have Jesus condemned. And so they figured, well, what would have taken place? These gospel writers, or maybe they're using traditions that developed before them, they're using traditions that developed because people just say, well, what would have happened at Jesus' trial? What's likely to have happened? And then they make up that likeliness, and they put that into the story. Now, we go apart from these three Gospels to, uh, to John's Gospel, and we notice that now Jesus it, suddenly, the whole thing is rewritten. So whereas, in fact, in Mark's Gospel, you will find, for example, that Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, indicating that he has a will different from that of the Father, but nevertheless, he submits his will. In John's Gospel, uh, we're told that Jesus wouldn't pray like that. In John 13, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, or when he approaches Jerusalem, he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason that I came to this hour. So this is a very different presentation in John's Gospel. John doesn't have the Garden of Gethsemane prayer in which Jesus says, Save me from this hour. In John, Jesus wouldn't pray like that. In the other Gospels, Judas Iscariot is necessary for uh, surrendering Jesus to the authorities. But in John's Gospel, John uh, it, it has Jesus handing himself over to the authorities. They do not dare arrest him, just his voice blows them over. Right from the very beginning in the Gospel according to John, uh, John the Baptist uh, declares that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we have here a, a developing Christology over time. Why did the early uh, Christians think that uh, Jesus is is time. Not, it's because largely uh, John's gospel and this development over time. There's more that could be given as well. Um, I will also I could also say that you know, John's gospel. We have uh, a testimony from uh, Irenaeus of Lyon that that John's gospel was composed by John the Apostle when John was the president in Ephesus. Now, where's Ephesus? It's very close to Smyrna and Asia Minor, where. Um, Polycarp was bishop, um, and we know from Irenaeus tells us that he himself was a disciple of Polycarp, and that Polycarp himself was a disciple of John the Apostle. And so if you accept the Islamic Isnanchines, which are based <laughs> on oral tradition, then we, we have a written Isnad. Exactly. Uh, so we have uh, Irenaeus, who tells us that he knew Polycarp, um, who, and that Polycarp knew John, um, and we have we have uh, Polycarp's epistle to the Philippian Church. We have uh, Irenaeus against heresies. So we have a written as no chain. Let's focus on this idea of a chain of transmission from John to Irenaeus through Polycarp. Paul Turman has some interesting thoughts on this idea. Let me stress yet again that there is no one who calls the fourth gospel John until Irenaeus and the Muratorian canon. It is interesting that in later legends two particular proto-Orthodox church fathers of the early to mid-2nd century, Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, and Papias, are both said to have been companions of John, the son of Zebedee. Polycarp was said to have been his disciple, one who sat at his feet. Bart Ehrman goes on. Some scholars maintain that these traditions are historically creditable. I myself do not. I think these are legends meant to buttress the credentials and therefore the authority of Polycarp and Papias. So he believes these are fabrications. It's interesting and worth reflecting on that we have an actual letter from Polycarp in which he quotes from Matthew, Mark and Luke. 
but not from John. Why would that be? If John was the teacher of Polycarp, and if John wrote the fourth gospel, why would that be? My view, this is uh, Paul Terman speaking, is that either John was not his teacher, or he did not think John wrote the gospel. And secondly, the claim that Irenaeus had some sort of chain of transmission that went back to John is a thorn in the side of the Trinitarian because Irenaeus does not seem to be a Trinitarian and if you want to maintain that there was some sort of uh, chain of transmission from John to Irenaeus then that indicates that John was not a Trinitarian. It couldn't be clearer for Irenaeus, the one true God is not the Trinity, not a triune God. Irenaeus is not a Trinitarian, but he is a Unitarian. Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon in present-day France at the end of the 100s. He was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of Papias, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. Much of what we know about varieties of ancient Gnostic Christianity come from his writings. He argues correctly that they were unfaithful to the apostolic witness on many key points to put it mildly, <laughs> who, according to Irenaeus, is the one true God, the Trinity or the Father of Jesus. Let's listen to him. Quote, Wherefore, I do also call upon thee, Lord God of Abraham and God of Isaac and God of Jacob and Israel, who art the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who, through the abundance of thy mercy, hast had a favor toward us, that we should know thee, who hast made heaven and earth, who rulest over all, who art the only and the true God, above whom there is no other God. Grant by our Lord Jesus Christ the governing power of the Holy Spirit. Give to every reader of this book to know thee, that thou art God alone, to be strengthened in thee, and to avoid every heretical and godless and impious doctrine. Later in the book, Irenaeus says, Neither the prophets, nor the apostles, nor the Lord Christ in his own person did acknowledge any other Lord or God, but the God and Lord supreme. The prophets and the apostles confessing the Father and the Son, but naming no other as God, he means than the Father, and confessing no other as Lord, he means than the Son. And the Lord himself, in other words, Jesus, handing down to his disciples that he, the Father, is the only God and Lord, who is God and ruler of all. It is incumbent on us to follow, if we are their disciples indeed, their testimonies to this effect. Jesus did not declare to them another God besides him who made the promise to Abraham. There is therefore one and the same God, the Father of our Lord, who also promised through the prophets that he would send his forerunner, he means John the Baptist, uh, and his salvation, that is the word, he caused to be made visible to all flesh, the word himself being made incarnate. End quote. It couldn't be clearer, for Irenaeus, the one true God, is not the Trinity, not a triune God, but rather the Father of Jesus, just like the New Testament says. But isn't the Son, for Irenaeus, equally divine with the Father? No. According to Irenaeus, the Father knows more than the Son knows, and is greater than the Son. Listen to him argue against certain Gnostics. He says, quote, but beyond reason, inflated with your own wisdom, you presumptuously maintain that you are, you are acquainted with the unspeakable mysteries of God, while even the Lord, the very Son of God, allowed that the Father alone knows the very day and hour of judgment, when he plainly declares, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, neither the Father but the Son only. He says, the Son was not ashamed to ascribe the knowledge of that day to the Father only. If anyone should acquire the reason why the Father, who has fellowship with the Son in all things, has been declared by the Lord alone to know the hour and the day of judgment, he will find at present no more suitable or becoming or safe reason than this, since indeed the Lord is the only Master, that we may learn through him that the Father is above all things. For the Father, he says, is greater than I. The Father, therefore, has been declared by our Lord to excel with respect to knowledge. For this reason, that we too, as long as we are connected with the scheme of things in this world, should leave perfect knowledge and such questions as have been mentioned to God, 
and should not by any chance, while we seek to investigate the sublime nature of the Father, fall into the danger of starting the question whether there is another God above God. End quote. Sometimes in his arguments against the Gnostics, Irenaeus pauses to cite a common creed, presumably baptismal creeds, at any rate summaries of belief which he says are used by Catholic Christians in the late 100s. Here is one of them. The rule of truth which we hold is that there is one God Almighty who made all things by his word and fashioned and formed out of that which has no existence all things which exist. The Father made all things by him. For God needs none of these things, but is he who, by his word and spirit, makes and disposes and governs all things and commands all things into existence. He who formed the world is the God of Abraham, above whom there is no other God. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. End quote. For Irenaeus, the Father and the one God, and the God of Abraham are one and the same. The word, that is for him the pre-human Jesus, and the spirit are his instruments in the creation and governance of the cosmos. But the ultimate source of all else, including these two instruments, is God, that is, the Father. These three are nowhere said by Irenaeus to be or to compose the one true God, nor are they equally divine. The Father is divine in a way in which nothing else is. Irenaeus is not a Trinitarian, but he is a Unitarian. 